Okay, I think we're live. Uh, like I say, sometimes it sits there and says live, and it blinks off, and then comes back live again. So I never know which one, when to jump. But um, I'm Steve Clegg, the interim pastor at Second Baptist Church in St. Paul's, and this is our midweek Bible study. And we are still in the book of Isaiah. We're actually up to what I call part 23. Um, we're going to do a little bit of jumping tonight. I'm um, trying to move through a little bit, um, but also not to get hung up some of the um, verbiage, I guess, maybe is a good word for it. Not that it's um, not all important, but like I say, sometimes there's just speeches that some people make that I think you get to just very quickly, and that's part of the case this evening. Um, with that, a um, way of announcements. Um, we have started back Sunday school, um, 9 o'clock. Um, a faithful workers class is meeting in the sanctuary. Like I said, we're not doing an opening, so come directly in, go directly to your classes. Um, we're going to continue this way. Then also, Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. will be our morning service. Um, and we'll continue to transmit our 87.9 on, on the radio, um, FM. So if you'd like to stay in your car, if you feel more comfortable that way, that's fine. Um, we're just trying to give options. Then also, we'll be posting um, the sermon portion of the service on um, Facebook. Um, so that's been working out. Um, also, we ask um, when you come in, wear a mask when you come into the church. If you're fully vaccinated, then once you get to your seat, you can take your mask off. Um, if you're not fully vaccinated, we ask that you keep your mask on the whole time. Now, we're asking everybody to refrain from the handshaking and the hugging. Um, like I say, if you're not keeping up with the news and all, the Omicron virus is much more contagious. And like I say, the other, um, I, there's so many different versions now, I've lost track of them. The other um, most recent um, variant um, is predominant in our area and it is contagious and it is also um, highly dangerous. Um, so we're not, definitely don't want to be spreading any of that around. And then also I read today, North Carolina reported its first flu death, which means that the flu virus is running rampant. And so just as the same precautions we use to prevent COVID spread, we also use to spread, um, to prevent the flu. Um, so like I said, we're just keep the body contact to a minimum, you know, use the, um, the fist pump or the elbow, um, or just put a big smile on and wave from where you're at. Yeah, I mean, whatever it takes, but um, let's just keep each other safe. Um, so we'll be doing that. Um, then also, um, like I say, WMU is collecting the Lottie Moon Christmas offering during the month of December. The envelopes are in the front. Um, these are up there, and there's also a prayer guide, um, um, the Praying Through Prayer. Um, that goes that your week there for international missions um, So you can use that um, don't necessarily have to be just that particular week. You can always use a prayer guide to help guide your prayers um, and Then like I say the goal is 2000 Continue member the um, food pantry at the Methodist Church. There's definitely those needs in the community um, So like I say a lot going on there then also um, a card was sent to the church. Um, read that. Lord, for those who make a difference, who live out their faith with kindness and care, who reflect your love in so many ways, big and small, thank you. Um, thank you for your, the beautiful hours from the church. Most of all, thank you, each of you, for all of the love and support shown to me and my family during this difficult time. I feel so blessed to, be, to call you my church family. Your kindness was very much appreciated. I love you, Patsy. Um, so like I say, um, continue to remember Patsy um, after the death of her mother. Um, so we continue to pray, her, pray for her. Um, in our bulletin, um, prayer list, Joe and Marion Edwards, um, Ronnie Locklear, um, Donna and Jordan Floyd, Louise McLean, um, Mike and Teresa Ivey, Shirlene Hammonds, Danielle Smith, the family of Peggy DeLuca, as many you know, um, Peggy had passed. Um, Kenny Jackson, um, Pearl Jackson, Angie Baxley, Gina White, Carol Powers, Tom Marie Taylor, Jada Clayton, Ashley Baxley, Kim Hewitt, Richard Holbrook, J.J. Johnson, Karen Clegg, David Warren, Matthew Ward, Kathy Beanie, Michael Davis um, is under the weather, um, Beth Ward, Mac McMorrow. Um, Mac had a procedure this week and then looking at surgery in January. Um, we'll keep you posted on that. 
Um, Peggy Kane, Joe Pate, Van Garganis, Diane Townsend, continue member Diane, Eugene Florian Eford, Shannon Britt, Chloe Akers, Junior House, Tamara Overby, Billy McKenzie, um, still um, needing to get his strength back. Dan Beard um, went to the ER. They sent him back home. Has a very serious infection. Um, so continue remember Dan, um, Amanda Kane, Linda Cornelius Hunter, Frisch Family, Daryl Britt, Nash White, Judy Clark, Lisa Ray Rodriguez, Bobby Pate, Patsy Butler, Wanda Carter, Wanda Carter, Kyle Edwards, um, the Supreme Court decision. Of course, you know, the one everybody's waiting for is the abortion issue. Not expected to be sent down until the early spring. Although there's other issues on the docket we need to be praying about. Um, the pulpit committee, our church, the lost or nationist leaders, our troops and their families, and then the police officers, and then the pastors and their family. Um, and then others that we're listing, um, Clark Godfrey, his cancer's returned. Um, Sean McBride has pneumonia. Um, Connie's grandson, Cameron, will have to have a cyst removed. Um, Donna Floyd is having heart issues. Um, Jeffrey has a shoulder coming, a shoulder surgery coming up. Carolyn Hall, um, JBL McNeil, 11 year old, that's Deb's patient, um, a long recovery, but also he's asking questions about God. So let's just continue to remember him. Um, all the tornado victims and the families of those that lost loved ones. Um, like I say, you can just watch the news. Devastating tragedy, um, the amount of that's going on. Um, Ricky Hill is waiting on a biopsy report. Um, find out. Um, and then praise Angie's um, daughter that was in the car wreck. Um, even though it's something that's you know bad that's happened, God is using it in a good way um, in some way. So just continue to remember that. Um, Mabel's daughter-in-law's father is doing better. Um, the praise report. And then Betty Holland, um, Connie's sister. Just having a hard time, so remember her, and just also remember me as I've got a doctor's appointment tomorrow. Um, hopefully, we'll get some answers um, from all the tests. The test results have been doing with me, and then also I'll have an MRI um, the first of the year um, for some additional tests. So nothing too serious, but just some things out of whack, and they got to get them back in place. So got all that going on. Um, like I say, Peggy's. Um, Trying to remember all the details. Uh, basically, visitation from 1 to 2 tomorrow at the church, and then the funeral service will be at the church, and then there'll be a graveside um, following that. Um, all that's out there on the um, obituary with the funeral home. So, like I say, if you need any questions there, I'm sure they can help you there. Um, all that going on, um, remember our country, um, remember the holiday. Um, just seeing some outrageous driving. It seems like worse than normal. I mean, you know, I always see some crazy driving. Um, just seeing some outrageous driving lately. People just getting in a hurry. And it's dangerous. Somebody's going to get hurt. And like I say, we're sitting right here on the interstate. We hear all the sirens that go off. And many of those are for interstate accidents and other things. And so um, keep that in prayer. Also, remember our schools. Um, I just continue um, have issues and it's not just our school system it's school systems across the state I think I heard today I'm trying to remember the number I think they have found 21 um, handguns with, um, in Cross Cumberland County on their schools um, we've had incidences locally matter of fact um, public schools Robinson County put out notice please Reminding parents to practice gun safety. Now, that's that's, that's an interesting discussion when you think about um, public schools of Robinson County talking about parents about public um, practicing gun safety, meaning basically keep your guns secured and know where they're at. There's been enough incidences of the schools coming on campus, and like I say, we don't need to see any more of that. Um, gun violence is definitely up. Violence as a whole is definitely up. So, like I say... Oh, excuse me, it's been a long day. I, I apologize for that. Um, so like I say, a lot going on there. Be in prayer for our schools. Be in prayer for our country. Um, a lot of people just struggling. Like I say, it, we, we talk about it. We, we see a lot of attention focused on just one or two towns that are hit with the tornadoes. Um, don't know how many of you are watching the news when all that was taking place. I, I watched some of it 
um, as they were talking about, I think at one time they were counting 15 or 16 tornadoes potentially on the ground at the same time, all the way from Arkansas all the way up. If not on the ground, they're forming, and I mean, they had warnings going up left and right, and we watched watching some of the weather station that evening for about an hour or so, and it was just horrifying, and then talking about all that happening on over into the night, and it was the wee hours of morning when some of the worst destruction was done. Um, this entire section of the country, a lot of people's lives have been upset. Um, a lot of them lost everything, um, so like I say. And then obviously the lives that were lost, and we're still not sure how many more they'll find. So, keep all that in prayer. Um, so with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your many blessings. And Father, we just praise you and give you the glory. And Father, we just ask that you'll just forgive us of our sins. Forgive us where we're going astray, Lord. Too many times we get caught up in the world and get running and running, and we don't take you into account, and we get caught up, and the world draws us in. Father, forgive us. And Father, help us keep our eyes focused on you and help us to focus on the things that you'd have us to do. So many times we want to draw closer to you or we want the blessings, but we don't do our part. We don't do the things that we should be doing, the commitment to you and the sacrifice. Sometimes we want, to, we want our cake and eat it too, and it don't work that way. And Father, we just pray that you just guide us, move us, and embolden us. And we'll do, do your will. And Father, our prayer list is extensive. Father, we've had recent deaths in our church family and friends. And Father, we just pray for those families. And Father, bless them and keep them. It's it's difficult, and especially being close to the holidays, this makes it that much worse. Father, just comfort them. It's tough. And Father, we just need you to wrap your arms around them. Father, use us to bless them. Use us to comfort them as well. God and direct us in all that we do, Lord, to help them and help others. It's not just within our church, but within our community. As we continue to see deaths from the virus and the different things that are going on, and Father, even here and now, more and more about hospital care being denied. I know there's just no room to take in people that have other conditions. In some cases, people are being turned away or moved to other hospitals or not getting the full treatment they need sometimes. Father, we just pray for these situations. And Father, we pray for those on our prayer list, Lord. We have many that are shut in that are limited. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless them. Strengthen them, Lord. And Father, be with the caregivers and the families around them, Lord. Bless them and keep them. And Father, we just pray that you'll watch over and most of all, let them know that they're loved. In this time when so many, so many things are of isolation and limited access and all, it's easy to feel lonely, and especially around holidays, it's hard. Lord, let them feel your love. Let them feel the love of their family and friends and all those that are close to them, Lord. Bless them and keep them. And Father, we pray for those um, that are having upcoming procedures. Um, some are waiting results of procedures and tests have been done. And Father, others will have surgeries that will be scheduled even into the first part of next year. Bless them, Lord. And we know the healing is already taking place. You've already set the stage and that all healing will come from you, Father. And Father, we just praise you for that. Guide the doctors and the technicians and nurses and the caregivers, Lord. And be with those families for when people go through these things, it can be a strain on the family. Bless them, Lord, as well. And Father, we just pray for good results and good outcomes and father we know and we've seen recently the demonstration of your healing as we've had those who have had surgeries recently and lord they're healing and getting stronger and some you hardly tell they've ever had a surgery and others lord that have been waiting test results got good test results so all that was good and those that were seeking answers found answers lord and it's just your hand at work and father we give you the glory and the praise for that and Father, we pray for our schools. Bless our schools locally and across this nation. Father, our schools need to be places of learning, places that kids can feel safe and be taken care of and that they can learn and grow stronger together. Father, bless them and keep them in the schools and be with the teachers and the administrators and all those that also work in the schools. 
And Father, be with our military, Lord. Many are overseas or away from their family, be it on a base in the country or somewhere else, but they're not going to be with their family this year at Christmas or during this time of year, and it's hard on them, some of them for the first time. And Father, bless them. Bless them, Lord, and let them not be depressed. But just let them wait and celebrate later. Father, they just need your comfort. And I pray that someone will reach out to them and share their love with them and help them to get through the times if they're having a difficult time. And Father, if we can bless them in some way, let it use us or to bless their family here that's behind us, separated from them. Father, let us be encouragement for that. And Father, we pray for our first responders, those that in this time of year are going to be busier than normal. Be it with fires, be it with car wrecks, be it with whatever that's going on, accidents and and all that's going to happen. Holidays are always busier, it seems like, and more things happen as more people get out and get moved around. Father, be with all of them. Watch over and keep them, Lord, and strengthen them as they go through this time, as it will be very tiring on them. And Father, we pray. We pray for the personal and private concerns. As demonstrated Sunday by the uplifted hands, there's many more. You know each and every one of those personal and private concerns and requests, and Father, bless them. Hear their prayers and requests and respond to them, guide them through it. Their their desire may not be the right answer. You may need to, to show them the right answer. That they'll understand that your will is best and guide them through that, Lord, and let them be blessed because of it. Let them hearken unto you, Lord. And let them be strengthened by you as they go through these times. And Father, we pray that Christmas will be about Christmas. Christmas as in Christ. That it will be about Jesus. It will not be about the commercialism and all the gift giving or gift give greed, greed, I should say. Honestly, we should be focused more on giving and receiving at this time of year. Father, let us be people of giving, giving of love, giving of caring, of compassion, that will bring glory to your name. And Father, be with the churches, strengthen them, Lord, protect them, that attend them as they're doing various different ways. But Father, watch over the churches, may they draw together and function as one body of Christ. Let us reach the community, our state, our nation, whatever it is that you spread us out to, Lord. Father, use us that our community and those around us and wherever we go will see Jesus. Not to see the world reflected in us, but see Jesus reflected in us and through us. Bless our Bible study. Bless this time, Lord. May all that we do bring glory to your name. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Um, like I say, if you want to be turning in your Bibles to Isaiah, we're going to be on over um, up into chapters 36 through 39. We're basically going to be in 36, a little bit of 37, just reading a few excerpts um, as we go through that. Um, so like I say, we're moving right on through. Like I say, we're up to chapter 36, and we've been on this a while, but we're going to be on it a while longer. Isaiah is a long book. And um, like I say, we got through the woes, and and now we're sort of at what is an interlude or an intermission between two sections of um, the book of Isaiah. Um, and we're going to be discussing King Hezekiah, and Hezekiah is kind of neat um, king um, next to David and Solomon. Um, no king of Judah is given more attention in the Bible. This King Hezekiah is given a lot of attention. Um, there's 11 chapters um, devoted to him in 2 Kings, um, and then in Chronicles, and then obviously here in the book of Isaiah, we're talking about him in between chapters 36 and 39, and kind of a tough, I don't want to say he had a tough life, but there's some things that happened that were tough for him, 
And we're going to talk about some of that. And he trusted in the Lord. Now, he was faithful to God. He trusted in the Lord of Israel. And it says, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that none so that after him was none like him among the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. Very unique um, individual, set apart, and his trust in God was great. And that's in 2 Kings 18 and 5. Now, Hezekiah began his reign about 715 B.C. Um, though at one time, he, though he may have been the co-regent with his father as early as 729 B.C., now, he restored the temple facilities he, and the services of worship. He took on some things and really he was very unpopular um, because he destroyed the idols. Um, he tore down the high places. Um, and one of the commentaries says, you know, a lot of times people would build these shrines. Um, they're called hill shrines up on the hills. And they would falsely worship God there. And they didn't give a whole lot of detail. Basically, people weren't worshiping God the way they should be. And um, so Hezekiah sought to bring the people back to a vital, true, living faith in God. Not a, oh, we worship God, you know, kind of lighthearted. No, he was getting down into it very seriously. Um... He led the people in a nationwide two-week celebration of Passover. Two weeks. And, you know, remember Passover is, you know, commemorating coming up out of Egypt. And so much so, remember the kingdom was divided. You had the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. He was in the southern kingdom. He invited the Jews from the northern kingdom. Hey, come down and celebrate Passover with it. He was not only concerned about those in the southern kingdom, but all the Jews, all the Hebrews. He wanted all of them to come back to God. And it says in 2 Chronicles 31, 21, it says, And in every work that he began in the service of the house of God, and in the law, and in the commandments, to see his God, he did it with all his heart and prospered. He gave his all. And immediately when I read that, um, going through the study, it jumped out at me, um, the other scripture we talk about, Colossians 3, 23 and 3, 24. And it says, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that the Lord, ye sh that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Again, when we serve God, God and we do it with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, when we focus entirely on him, we will be rewarded. Now, a lot of people think, well, oh, we're going to get riches and treasures. No. Remember, most of what we have or the rewards that we'll receive is our inheritance. Now, what is our inheritance? Obviously, part of the kingdom of heaven. We are co-heirs with Christ. What is God's will be ours, in a sense. And, all. and, you know, it's not about the here and now, but which is more important to you? What would last a few days or what will last you an eternity? Now, I am not saying that God will not reward you or bless you here and now. Some people say, well, you're saying he'll never do it. That's not what I'm saying. God works in the ways that he sees fit and best for you. Remember, his ways are good, and he thinks of the good ways for you and not the bad. He has a plan for you. So whether he prospers you or blesses you here and now or later is up to him for what he sees best for you. We know that he has blessed people here on earth. Because here it just says Hezekiah was blessed and he prospered in all that he did. We know that Job was blessed in the here and now as well as after. And David was blessed and Solomon was blessed. So it's not beyond God, but don't bank on that or put it in a sense of this is what I expect God to give me. Maybe that's the best way of saying it. It's not that God will bless you like the, you know, the Sears and Roebuck Christmas wish book. You know, a lot of people try to look at God that way. Oh, if I do what he says, he'll give me whatever I want. And it's like the Christmas wish book. You know, as a child, I circled everything. And uh, it was a wish. You know, I wanted a racetrack. I wanted, the, you know, the bike. I wanted the train set. I wanted, the, you know. It doesn't work out with God. God's going to bless you where he sees your need for the blessing. 
And sometimes it'll amaze you where he puts it. I have seen some wonderful blessings and seen some, and talked to some people that have been blessed in ways that they just weren't expecting. And it's because God cared and he blessed them where they needed it. And not always where they were expecting it. So like I say, he'll reward you in eternity, but also there are blessings that will come to us here on earth. Um, with that, now after the fall of the northern kingdom, which occurred in 722 B.C., Judah had constant problems with Assyria. Remember, Assyria is sitting out there. And we're going to see this in this interlude or this intermission in these four chapters. We're going to see a discussion about Assyria and a discussion about Babylon. Now, Isaiah has talked about Babylon um, earlier on, but not a whole lot. Most of the discussion, a lot of discussions focus around Assyria. And Hezekiah, when he fully became king, he finally rebelled against Assyria's influence. He finally pushed him back and said, no. Now, here's where Hezekiah is human, and we're going to see that. And so the king of Syria, Sinab Cherub, threatened to attack. Hezekiah took it upon himself to try to bribe him or give him a tribute not to. And it's discussed in verses 13 through 16 and, and all. But really what it was, Hezekiah got caught up in a moment and had a lapse of faith. And I think we all can understand a lapse of faith. Sometimes we get caught up and we're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to take care of something and we forget to consult God. We forget to go to God with the issue. We try to take care of it ourselves. We're so caught up in it that we jump out there and we try to take care of it without consulting God. And that's exactly what Hezekiah did. He thought he was doing the right thing. Trying to keep the peace, to keep um, Sennacherib from attacking you know, thinking that was the best thing for the people, but it wasn't the way God wanted it handled. And because of that, it created problems for um, Hezekiah. Now, Sennacherib accepted the treasures or the tribute, but then he turned around and he reneged on the treaty. He, he, he just, you know, broke the treaty. And in 701 BC, he invaded Judah. And we're going to see a little bit in chapters 36 and 37, the miraculous deliverance of God's people. Um, and like I could say, there's a different things in here, and we'll, we'll get into more of it. But you know, Hezekiah has a sickness that comes about him. Um, and it kind of drops out of chronological order, but it's there. The order is there to help us do the transition from the first half of Isaiah to the second and so the chronology in that um, big an issue so much but we see um, how, how do I put this Hezekiah is sick and then he receives the envoys um, from the Assyrian king and that's over in Isaiah 39 and all this kind of takes place before the Assyrian invasion, although we'll talk about some of that before. And so there's a lot of discussion, like say, with chronology. But you understand the events is a more important thing. Because um, remember, the Bible is not writ written in chronological order. Um, it wasn't always written in a certain order of things that happen um, that we think makes sense. Sometimes because God put it there the way he wanted us to see it. Now, not to confuse us, but again, it's the message that's important, not the history, not the chronology. And a lot of people will try to throw stones at the Bible because it's not chronological order. Well, it wasn't written to be a history book. It wasn't written to start out with beginning time and go all the way. It wasn't written to be chronologically correct. You know, it was written to talk about the events and the things that God needed us to know. So like I say, this is sort of a bridge gap, these four chapters, and we'll see that. But there's also some valuable lessons that we're going to see in this, and that's why we come back to Hezekiah. Isaiah talks about Hezekiah, and we're taught about him in these chapters, because he has some valuable lessons on faith and prayer and the dangers of pride. Sometimes, you know, you can be the best Christian, sometimes your pride will get the best of you. And we're going to see some of that today. So, like I say, and there's different problems that Hezekiah goes through and temptations. And like I say, we'll address some of that. So, like I say, um, 
Hezekiah faced basically three crises in a short time, an international crisis being the invasion of the Assyrian army, a personal crisis, which is a sickness that brought him near to death, and then a national crisis is the, vid, is the visitation of the Babylonian envoys, which is the latter part of what we're sort of kind of referencing to. And he came through the first two victoriously, um, but the third one tripped him up, and he's human. And like I say, we... We like to say, well, God didn't do his part. No. A lot of times we get in God's way. We we allow our human side to jump out and do things that we shouldn't. Rather than holding on, we mess up and we act out in a worldly fashion when we shouldn't. But even with that, Hezekiah was a great and godly man. But he was still a man. Job was a great and godly man. But he was still a man. David did some wonderful things, but he was still a man. He, he had sins. Solomon could have much been much greater. And a lot of people really don't think about it, but Solomon missed a lot of his potential because he fell into the worldly ways during his life. And he did some things that he wasn't supposed to. He was blessed because of his early decisions and God moved on. But we never hear Solomon spoke about as living out a long and old age. It, it really doesn't talk that because of the decisions that he made and took up foreign wives and built foreign temples for him and, or temples for foreign gods and other things that he did in his lifetime that were dishonoring to God. And because of that, he didn't really reap all the blessings that could have been there because he was human. He tried to please his wife instead of putting God first. And we have to be careful in our marriages. What's that tell us? We've got to make sure we do or, you know, that we follow God and put him first in our marriage before we put the other person. And so, like I say, we'll see that. And like I say, with this um, being a man, you know, Hezekiah was, has weaknesses. Um, one, he obviously had the frailties of human flesh because he has an illness. Uh, and then other things is he, he messed up, made some decisions he shouldn't have. So we're going to read just a few verses. Like I say, we're going to kind of jump through 36 and 37 a little bit because there's some long dialogue in this, and I want to focus on more of the focus. So in 36 verses 1 through 3, it says, Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the, def came up against all the defense cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh, from Lachish to Jerusalem unto King Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool of the highway of the fuller's field. Then came forth unto him Elikim, Hilkiah's son, which was over the house, and Shepna, the scribe, and Joah, Asaph's son, and the recorder. Now, remember what Hezekiah is doing? He's bringing Israel back to God. He's bringing the Jewish people back to God. So it's the best of circumstances, and guess what? He's leading them through a reformation to be reunited with God and to have the fear of the Lord, and he had them put away all their idols, restored the temple, and so, and brought all this back. But instead of this great blessing coming forward, look what's happening. They're facing battles. Here comes the Assyrian king. And... So it kind of looks like a contradiction of, of what happens. But here came the invading king, Sennacherib, and he invaded Judah. And he, it's all the defense cities, cities without defenses and fortification. He took them. So he spread out across the land. And some people say, well, look, God turned a blind eye and a deaf ear to Hezekiah. No, that's not really what happened. Um, the invasion by Assyria, remember, we go back to the prophecies in the first part. The people turned away from God, the rebellious. And God said that they would be punished. There would be consequences of this. There are consequences to sin. One of the things people forget you can have sin in your life and you can seek God's forgiveness. The problem is, is that so many people forget that because they had that sin in their life, there's consequences. God can't, won't 
God can't undo all the damage created by you from sin. Okay? If your sin is that you killed somebody, he can't unkill them for you. All right? He can, but that's it's not going to happen. That's just not the way things work. You rob somebody, he can't unrob it. He can't just erase it and make everybody forget that it never happened. That's not the way it happens. The things that you've done, you have to face the consequences of it. And so, you know, what has happened with Israel? They, For this long period of time, they're chasing these other gods. There's consequences of their rebellion against God. And so here what's happening is the Assyrians come in. They're part of the God's punishment. And they've just taken over Judah and, and you know, they're now at Lachish, 30 miles southwest of Jerusalem is where they're located. And Sennacherib sent three of his most important officers to arrange Hezekiah's surrender. He says, hey, go get him and tell him to surrender. And the city, the city of the surrender would be Tartan. Um, excuse me, the three, excuse me, is Tartan, the commander, Rab Sars, the chief officer, and Rab Shaka, the field commander. I got my wording turned around there. These are the three he sends. And these are military titles. These aren't their personal names. These are what they call them under Assyria. And they were met by three of Judah's leading officials, Elikim, Shefna, and Joah. And where they met is very significant for it's the very place where Isaiah met or confronted Ahaz, Hezekiah's father some 30 years before. Not coincidence. God always has a purpose. Um, and Ahab, Ahaz had refused to trust the Lord but instead made a treaty with Assyria. And now the Assyrians are ready to take Jerusalem and Isaiah warned Ahaz what Assyria would do and his words were now fulfilled. Things are going to happen as they were prophesied. Now, what I'm going to read is just a part of Rav Shaka's um, speech. Remember, he sent him, um, sent, Chab, sent him to speak. And this is what he talks about. Listen to these, these I'm just going to read through verse 9. It actually goes all the way down into verse 21, 22. And Rabshaka said unto them, Say ye now to Hezekiah, Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? I say, sayest thou, but they are not vain words, I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, whereon if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all that trust in him. But if thou say to me, We trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away, and said to Judah and Jerusalem, Ye shall worship before this altar? Talking about the shrines on the hill places and all where false worship was really taking place now therefore give pledges i pray thee to my master the king of assyria and i will give thee two thousand horses if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them how then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants and put thy trust on egypt for chariots and for horsemen now it goes on and but you can see his obstinance and his arrogance and all. Hey, you know, who do you think you're going to trust? Who is going to save you? Egypt's not going to save you. If we gave you 2,000 horses and you filled them with riders, you still couldn't save yourself. We're too mighty for you. We're too great. And look at Hezekiah. He tore down your high places. And now who's, your God ain't even going to save you. And... It goes on and it's listed in commentaries as one of the most insolent and blasphemous found anywhere in scripture. And he reproached the God of Israel. He, he just really put God down. He just denounced him. 
And the whole time, what's he doing? He's emphasizing the greatness of the king of Assyria. Elevating Sennacherib and demoting God. Rising a man above God. And the thing was, he was saying this within the wall, closeness to the walls, that the people on the walls of Jerusalem could hear the speech, or and and the area could hear it. And his intention was to frighten them. He he was not there just to merely say, "Hey, go tell Hezekiah this." He wanted to put fear in the people because he wanted them scared so that they would surrender or even force Hezekiah to surrender. And as you know. Some people say this is early part of psychological warfare in the scripture. And everything that the Jews held dear, he tore down in words. Everything that was close to him, he took it away from him with his words saying, this is going to happen or this has happened or this is what, you know, and he, the, he takes the word trust and used it seven times. And he's asking him, who, who are you trusting? What's your confidence in? Who's going to deliver you? And he was tearing away so that they'd have no confidence in anything. And you know, he, he began with their strength. He knew they knew they were making treaties with Egypt. They knew that they had done it. But in their eyes, Egypt was nothing. It was a broken reed. Um, and as for trusting the Lord, he said, He's God's surely gonna fail. And Hezekiah yeah, in this had incurred the Lord's displeasure by removing the high places and the altars and requiring everybody to worship Jerusalem. Hezekiah did exactly what God told him to do. But in the people's eyes, where they thought they could worship all these other places, God said, no, you, you worship here. But they saw it as he took away something from us. And they know it. They are very astute to what was going on in the, in the Jerusalem culture, in the Hebrews, and in Israel, which tells you they had spies out there, obviously, to know all this going on, or they had heard from the people what was going on. And like I say, he said, your soldiers are too weak. If we even give them what they need, they're too weak to come and fight with us. And all the chariots and horsemen of Egypt, they'll never defeat the great Assyrian army. Now remember, Assyria is really up there at this time. They're at the pinnacle of their power, so to speak. And it goes on down through, and it, it, it starts talking about all that Assyria has done, and all. And he was just, we did it because of the will of God. Well, he was partially right in that. In the fact that God was using Assyria to punish him. That part, he's partially right. But they twisted it so that he says that you by fighting us, you're fighting against your own God. That part was a lie. <laughs> and all. They wouldn't be fighting against their own God. And all. But God is in charge. That part they figured it had right in the sense that he was using them to punish. But like I say, no nation can do what it pleases and use God as an excuse. And that's what they're saying here. Well, you'll never defeat us because God put us here. We're supposed to come do this. And this is why we're doing it. You know, they're saying God's reason. But that's not. They're falsely using it and all. Now, according to this field commander, Judah could not trust in its strategy, its military resources, its God. And they couldn't even trust their king. I mean, he's tearing them down. Wanting to put fear in them. Wanting to create this panic. And at the same time, he's elevating his king and saying, look at all of what we've done, how great we are. Who are you? And the people knew that everything was going to be ruined. The farms, the orchards, everything was going to be ruined by the Assyrian army. And that Judah was facing a bleak future. It, it, you know, under the Assyrians, it was going to be horrible. They had already seen what they were doing to the defense cities and what they were taking. And and if they set up the fortifications against Jerusalem, then, you know, hey, they could siege them to death and they'd just starve to death. And so he's trying to get them in their mind, hey, maybe you should surrender. And I'm sure there's people out there and looking at themselves and looking at their family saying, you know, we need to surrender. 
Better to live under the oppression of the Assyrians than die under King Hezekiah. That's sort of where they were. Or at least that's where he was trying to get them to and put the thoughts in their head. Now Hezekiah and Isaiah both had told the people to trust in the Lord. But the field commander reminded the people that the gods of other nations had, they hadn't succeeded against them either. And so who's going to protect them and deliver them? And so, and he, like I say, this is a really a speech that goes on and Samaria was defeated and, you know, their God didn't save them and he got all this stuff going on, right? And so God's, you know, here... God's telling them, hold on. Remember Hezekiah and Isaiah saying, hold on to God. Have faith, have faith. And when the problem looks so bad, and I mean, think about the people. They're looking out over the walls of Jerusalem. They're seeing this vast army. And all, and it's not even all the Assyrian army. It's just one part of it that's come up against them. It's massive. It's powerful. And they're like, what can we do? Who are we? You know, it's just like they're looking with their eyes and seeing this. They're like, what's going to happen? And they're forgetting their faith. They're living by their senses, their eyesight and everything and what they're hearing. But they're not living by their heart. They're struggling with it. And God's telling them, you got to walk by faith, not by sight. you got to hold on to them. That's over in Corinthians 5 and 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 and all. And to those Jews that were in Jerusalem who were living in unbelief, I guarantee you this guy was making a ton of sense. And I'm sure they were starting to stir up the people. Hey, this guy's right. You see that army out there? I mean, the people that didn't believe in God, didn't have faith, they're sitting there saying, we need to listen to him. And he made a very strong case. And for one without faith, you could see where they'd fall. But God had promised to deliver his people from the Assyrian army. And he would. And his word will stand. Now, read from you. It starts on the bottom of 36. And I'm just going to pick up 37 and read just the first eight verses. And it came to pass when King King uh, when King Hezekiah heard it that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. Now those that met with these these men from Assyria they also rent their clothes, listening to these words. Okay, they were and all they went into this mode. And he sent Elikim, who was over the household, and Shephna the scribe, and the elders and the priests, covered with covered with sackcloth unto Isaiah the prophet, son of Amos. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and of blasphemy, for the children are come to birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. It may be the Lord God will hear the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his, Assyria, his master, hath sent to reproach the living God, and will prove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that is left, so the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say unto your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid. Wow, how many times do we need to hear that in our life? When things are just beating us down and the problems are there and we get all upset and worried and everything, do we just need to hear the words, Be not afraid. Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Syria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So Rabshakeh Rabshak, uh, Rabshak returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish. By the king's order, nobody replied to the field commander's speech. This guy told him, don't answer him. You can listen to the speech, but just don't answer him. In the face of insolence, of arrogance, of pride boasting and all, the best thing is silence. We just call them blowhards. If they're going to blow the horn, just let them blow. 
Don't try to reason with him. Don't try to humble, because a blowhard ain't going to listen to anything. He's just going to blow, so to speak. And it, Jerusalem's deliverance did not depend on negotiating with this guy. It depended on one thing. Trusting on God. How many times the problems in our life does not depend on all the other circumstances, but it depends on one thing. Trusting in God. We miss that. So here, what, what is Hezekiah doing? Hezekiah and his officers humbled themselves before the Lord and sought his face. That's why they ripped their clothes and they put on sackcloth and everything. They humbling themselves. These are men of prominence that were fancy clothes and they were the prominent ones and everybody looked up to them and everything and what have they done? They've stripped off their fancy clothes and put on sackcloth. That rough, burly cloth that makes your skin itch and scratches you and, and everything. there's nothing appealing about it. It's just old cloth. You know, it's not flattering. It's humiliating. And they were trying to humiliate themselves before the people. What they were trying to do is humble themselves and say, God, we're not worthy. They humbled themselves and sought his face. They went into the temple and they recalled possibly the promises of God had given to Solomon when he had dedicated the temple. You know, if my people will which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will hear the land. Maybe that's what they went into the temple talking about. Maybe that's what they went in and prayed and prayed and prayed. Now the Lord had brought Assyria up to chase Judah, but he had determined that Jerusalem would not be taken by Assyria. Assyria would come this far and God would stop them. Now again, remember previous to this invasion, Hezekiah had been deathly ill and Isaiah had assured him of the deliverance. And God's promises are sure when God's people claim them and live by the faith, God can work. But if we don't believe God's promises and we don't live by God's word and we don't claim it as part of our lives, how can God work it out? Too many people try to reason away their blessings from God. Well, I was due. It's luck. It's fate. No. And so, in all this humbling and everything, Hezekiah sends word to Isaiah, hey, we need you to pray. And the king is calling out to God for help. His leaders are calling out God to help. And he's asking Isaiah to call out the Lord for help. See, in building up of our faith, the word of God and prayer go together. You can't have prayer without God's word. You can, but it's not going to be as good. Because what are you praying for? How do you know you're praying according to God's will? How do you know you're, you're praying what God wants you to pray in a sense? If you don't know who, who God is. See, you're going to learn who God is in his word. You're going to understand what God teaches, teaches and wants you to know about him and how he cares about you and how you're special to him and how he wants good for you. And all this becomes part of that and helps us to pray to God on a personal level. And Isaiah hears from the king's messengers and he sends word back. He says, one, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Two, the Assyrians are leaving. God says the Assyrians are leaving. And three, the great king of Assyria will die. Now that's pretty good news. That which is standing at your doorstep, screaming out, saying how horrible your God is, how horrible it is, I have nothing that can save you. And God says, don't be afraid. They're leaving and he's going to die. Problem solved. And what did Hezekiah and his soldiers do? Did they have to lift up a sword? Did they have to fight? No. God just removed it all. 
took it away. Because when the three Assyrian officers returned back to the headquarters, they learned that the Egyptian army was on its way to help defend Hezekiah. And Sennacherib did not want to fight a war on two fronts. It's never good as an army to fight on two sides. You want your army always in front of you. You don't want them behind you and in front of you. That don't work. Or on your both flanks, however you want to look at it. So he withdrew from it. Wow. Think about that. They moved off. Now, since Arab would start putting more pressure on Jerusalem to surrender. And Hezekiah would took the letter that was sent to him from Sinach Arab and he took it to the temple and put it out before the Lord. And we're going to stop there this evening. But I want you to understand Hezekiah messed up. He was human. Me and you are human and we're going to mess up. But that didn't stop God from helping him. It didn't stop God from blessing him. It didn't stop God from making him prosper. Because Hezekiah realized his mistakes and went to the temple and humbled himself and sought forgiveness. Not only for himself, but for his people. He pleaded for his people. It wasn't pleading for himself so much as it was his people. He had faith. He trusted God to carry out his word and to hold to his promises. See, we need to learn from that and we also need to do the same thing. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. And Father, we give you the glory. And Father, help us to hold on in faith. Let us not be a people of weakness, but let us be a people who hold on in faith. That we know your word and we claim it. And we live by it and are strengthened by it. Father, let us grow in you and be closer to you, Lord. That we can be emboldened to do the things that you've called us to do. Bless us and keep us, Lord, in all things. Watch over us and bring us back together next time. And may we give glory to your name in all things. Which in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless you. And have a good night.